Chapter 1. Zo, the God kind of life. The cry of every human heart is to live a life fulfilled and contented life free of the fear of want and death. In trying to obtain this life of contentment and immorality, immortality, we human creatures grasp for many straws that we think will help us find it. Some of the straws we grasp for our money, pleasure, power, prestige, fame, humanitarianism, uh, self-gratification, freedom, accomplishment, security, uh, greatness, friendship, etc. Whatever we straw we are holding onto invitable breaks. When this happens, we reach out for another, and another, and another. But we realize it, our life is over. And instead of having contentment and immortality, all we got is a bunch of broken straws. There is a person who claimed to be able to provide this kind of life. This person is Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua, who is Lord Jesus name in Hebrew. Jesus is a Greek translation. Uh, Hamashiach is the Messiah. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. The Apostle John recorded this statement by Jesus in John chapter 10 verse 10. The Greek word that Jesus used for life in this verse is zo. This word refers to the kind of life that comes only from God. It is the eternal life of God, breathed, or pip, there's a word for to breathe into, and it's a very like p, p sound as if like God breathed his life into the, his creation. It is the eternal life of God breathed into us. Jesus said that he could and would give his eternal life to all who would come to him. And he can do this because he has this life within himself and desires to share it with us. Jesus said that this is an abundant life. Whenever we come to see Jesus, he shares this life with us by giving us the Holy Spirit of God, or the Ruach HaKodesh. This is Hebrew for Holy Spirit. Um, thus, it is through the Holy Spirit that we receive and become partakers of the very life of God himself. When this God kind of life controls us, we find fulfillment, contentment, and freedom from the fear of want and death. We often speak of this as the life in the spirit. The abundant life in the spirit also enables us to have authority, power, and victory over sin, Satan, and eventually death itself. So you see, this is just the kind of life for which we are looking for. God's life is not like the broken straws of the world, and he will share it with anyone and everyone who will come to him through Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, Knowing Your Dominion. When God made Adam, he gave him dominion or rule over planet earth. We read in the book of Genesis, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God given dominion. And he has an illustration of um, a lamb. God had given Adam and Eve the title deed to planet earth. They had a divine mandate and legal right to rule the earth for the glory of God. But this right to rule was effective for Adam and Eve only as long as they live in the obedience and loving fellowship with God. They were in authority over everything on planet earth just as long as they themselves lived under God's authority. Dominion lost. But as Genesis account records, Satan tempted Adam and Eve to disobey. And when Adam and Eve yielded to the temptation, they lost their position of rule and authority to Satan. The effect of this is that Adam transferred the title deed of the planet Earth to Satan. Satan then became the ruler and master of everything on planet Earth, including Adam and Eve. Adam, therefore, not only lost the divine right to rule planet Earth, but he himself came under the dominion of Satan. The rule of Satan. Jesus spoke of Satan as the prince of this world. See John chapter 12 verse 31. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul referred to Satan as the god of this world. To the Ephesians, he spoke of Satan as the prince of power of the air. John wrote that the whole world is in the power of the evil one, whether they know it or not. 
In these and many other places in the Bible, we learn that Adam and Eve and all their descendants came under Satan's dominion, which is us. A deadly bondage. What does it mean to be under Satan's dominion? Basically it means that we become his slaves and must do whatever he tells us. The Bible tells us that the work of Satan is sin. 1 John 3, 8. Satan wants us to sin. He wants us to disobey God. And since we are under his authority, this is exactly what we do. The Bible says that all of us have sin and have the penalty of our sin is death. Paul said that this way to the Romans, therefore, just as through one man, enters, man's, man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, Romans 5.12. All of Adam's descendants inherited his, this slavery to sin, his tendency towards sin and fear of death. Now, of course, Satan doesn't tell us that we are his slaves. We wouldn't want to hear that, would we? That would make us very upset. Why? Because in our pride, we like to think we are our own person, doing our own thing. So Satan lets us believe this, and we go through life serving him while thinking we are our own masters. But the Bible says nobody does their own thing. We're either doing God's thing or Satan's thing. So there's no gray area. We are either slaves to God or slaves to the devil. Paul wrote to the Romans, Don't you realize that you can choose your own master? You can choose sin with death or else obedience with acquittal. The one to whom you offer yourself, he will take you and be your master and you will be his slave. Romans 6.16 6, Peter wrote, A man is a slave to whatever controls him. 2 Peter 2.19 Jesus said, You are slaves of sin every one of you even though we don't like to hear it and most won't acknowledge it we are all born into this world as slaves to satan slaves to sin and slaves to the fear of death this is why we can't keep our new year's resolutions this is why we can't break the hold of self-destructive habits this is why we are all afraid to die a just restoration We've all got a problem. We need to be set free from this bondage. But our freedom must come in such a way that God's justice will not be violated. You see, God can't just suddenly change all the rules. God can't say to Satan, Too bad, Satan. You got this to play by the rules, but I don't. So the deal is off. I'm giving it all back to Adam. God must abide by his own laws of justice. Dominion over earth was given to man. And it was lost by man. Therefore, it can legally only be recovered by man. But what man? As we've just learned, wow. Adam and all of this descendants are slaves. And a slave has no legal standing. A slave cannot go into our court and appeal his case. There is no offspring of Adam, no seed of man, who can take the case for us. Yet somehow, a human must be found on whom Satan has no claim or who has no sin. Someone not in bondage to him. Someone who can go into the courtroom in heaven and represent us. Someone who can dismiss Satan's legal claim on us. We need another Adam. We need one who would be tempted just as the first Adam, but who would not yield to the temptation. Therefore, he would be able to restore dominion, rule, and authority to us. The promise of deliverance. And this is just what God promised. He would provide for us. He gave this promise immediately after Adam and Eve sinned. The promise of the coming deliverer in recorded in Genesis 3.15. God is speaking to Satan through the serpent. And he says, excuse me, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, um, the coming Messiah, or the coming king, who will defeat the devil, will bite the heel of the king, but the king will crush the serpent's head. Now, this is the most interesting statement. God says to Satan that he will have a seed. This just means that Satan will have spiritual children who will be under his dominion and rule. Satan's seed, or children, will be constantly at war with another seed from whom God identifies as the seed of the woman. 
God says the seed of woman is a he. Then he begins to talk about the continued spiritual warfare between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. This war eventually comes down to a personal confrontation between the two. Satan will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. This will be painful, but not fatal. The seed of the woman will then recover and bruise the head of the serpent. The, the bruise to the head will be a fatal blow from which Satan will not be able to recover. Now the curious part about the whole statement from whom God is his referral to the seed of woman, whoever heard of a woman having her own seed? That's not what the way of life is produced. The seed comes from man. But in this case, God says the one who will deliver the fatal blow to Satan will come from the seed of the woman. And um, eventually, Jesus is the seed of the woman. The prophet Isaiah also spoke of the seed of the woman. Um, he said, Therefore the Lord, Jehovah himself, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. The word Emmanuel means God is with us. Isaiah explained that the seed of a woman refers to a virgin birth. He said that it would be God himself coming to planet earth as a baby boy, a born of a virgin. The virgin would not be the mother of God, but would be the mother of a man God became. This son born of a virgin would be the one who would take dominion from Satan and restore it to us. Now in the New Testament, we learn the identity of the seed of the woman. Now the birth of Jesus Christ as follows. And so um, Mary was betrothed to Joseph and then Mary was um, impregnated by the Holy Spirit, not Joseph, her intended. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child and bear a son and they shall call him, call him Emmanuel. So Paul added that the statement in this letter to the Galatians, but when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman galatians 4 4 i hope you fully realize the significance of that we have just read these verses along with many others jesus christ is the creator god who came to the earth as a man born of a virgin in order to destroy the power of satan and restore dominion over the planet earth to man jesus the seed of a woman the woman Jesus had to be born perfect without sin, as Adam was created, created perfect without sin. This is why he could not be born of the seed of man. He couldn't be born through Joseph. If he had been born of the seed of man, he would have inherited Adam's sin nature, passed down through his bloodline. So something after the fall, the genetics of man was corrupted by sin. Um, that's why there's disease and awful, you know... Um, tragedies based like sometimes fatal diseases through genetics because the genetics that we know of is flawed by sin and corruption and Jesus could not have a human father because of that because um, if he was born out of man this would mean that Jesus would be Satan's slave like the rest of us yet legally according to God's justice he had to be a real human to take our place so quite logically at least in God's mind he was born of a virgin. Now what human mind would ever think that as a solution? Well, of course none. No one would ever think of a virgin birth. And even if they did happen to stumble upon the idea, they wouldn't suggest it to anybody. So Jesus was born perfect without sin as Adam was created perfect and without sin. Through his own test of obedience similar to Adam's, Jesus would set, free from the, set us free from the bondage to Satan, sin, and the fear of death. He would restore dominion over earth planet earth to all who would come to him and this is what paul had in mind when he wrote since by man adam came death but the by the man jesus came also the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die because of sin even so in christ jesus all shall be made alive and so it is written the first man adam was made a living soul the last adam jesus was made a quickening spirit or in another um Bibles it says a life giving spirit. Um, Saint Dominion challenge challenged. Jesus is a man on whom Satan has no claim. He is a man who can legally and morally challenge Satan. He is another Adam. This of course presents Satan with a real problem. He must figure out some way to get dominion over this Adam, just as the first one. He must get this new Adam, Jesus, to rebel against God, just as he did the first Adam. Satan becomes obsessed with this one scheme. 
He marshals all of the demon forces and uses every bit of his cunning to get Jesus to sin. We find the struggle of the ages coming face to face out in the hot desert. The two contestants are battling for dominion over man and planet Earth. Satan is tempting Jesus just as he did Adam in the garden. But where Adam was in, in a perfect environment, Jesus was hot, tired, hungry, and thirsty from 40 days of fasting in the desert. He was vulnerable, and Satan knew it. You can read about this clash in tra Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 and 11, NK. This is what had to happen. Satan approached Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones be to become bread. Now this is an interesting temptation. You see... No matter how hungry I am, I can't turn stones to bread, but the Son of God can, and Satan knew it. That's why he tempted Jesus in this way. Instead of yielding to the temptation, Jesus responded by telling Satan that, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But Satan didn't give up so easily. He tried again. <laughs> this time he took Jesus up to the top of the temple and said, Jesus, if you are the Son of Elohim, Throw yourself down from the top of his temple, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest, dash, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil knows um, scripture. He twists it. Again, Jesus resisted the temptation and said, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Well, by then, Satan was discouraged, but he was not yet ready to give up. So he tried once again. He took Jesus to the top of the mountain. In a fleeting moment of time, flashed all the kingdoms of the world before Jesus. And we don't know the time that he showed it. Uh, it might have been in the future. Then Satan said, Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. With this temptation, Satan was offering Jesus the title deed to the planet Earth that Adam gave, gave up. But the price was to become Satan's slave, just as with the first Adam. Now Jesus did not question Satan's right to offer him these kingdoms. He knew that Adam had legally handed them over to Satan. Jesus resisted the temptation and, and, it, and said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord Jehovah your God, and him only you shall serve. Again then came and ministered, the angels came and ministered to Jesus. He then returned victoriously to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. But Satan was not about to give up. There was too much at stake. So he tried again in the Garden of Gethsemane. Satan's temptation was so strong that Jesus agonized and sweat great drops of blood from his forehead. There all alone, Jesus as the Son of God cried out, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. In this cry of desperation, Jesus was looking ahead to the cross, but he was thinking about more than his physical suffering. He was thinking about his spiritual suffering. He was thinking about his soul being cut up from the fellowship of his heavenly father. For the first time in all eternity, the unity between God the Father and God the Son would be broken. This is because Jesus would become sin for us. God's eyes are too holy and too pure even to look upon sin. So Jesus knew that the Father would have to turn his face from him. This is what Jesus was agonizing over. To bypass the cross was his greatest temptation. Yet he said, nevertheless, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Jesus, our representative. Shortly afterwards, the Roman soldiers came and took Jesus. Um, after the seven, several mock trials, in a number of horrible, horrible beatings, they crucified him. Then on there on the cross, and for the next three days and nights, Jesus annulled and reversed the consequences of the failure of Adam. For a thousand years earlier, when he handed dominion over to Satan, Jesus experienced death and separation from the Father on our behalf. He took our sins as he became our innocent substitutionary sacrifice. Isaiah prophesied this would happen and said, Surely he hath bore our grief and carried our sor sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. The weight of all of our sins was more than Jesus could bear. So as the Son of Man, he cried out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. This was not a question, but a cry of desperation and anguish, as fellowship between Jesus and the Father was broken. Finally, Jesus dismissed his spirit and died. They took his body down and put it in a burial tomb. But his spirit and soul went to... I don't think you agree with this. This was necessary because the penalty for sin is death. This is the physical and spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from God. Jesus had to pay the full penalty for us. Paul wrote in Romans 8.32 that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Oh my gosh. Satan's colossal blunder. This was Satan's bruise to the heel of Jesus' in fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. His heel was literally bruised as he pushed himself up on the cross. But spiritually speaking, his heel was bruised as he was cut off from the Father and died as our sin substitute. But in his frantic effort to tempt Jesus to sin, Satan made the most colossal blunder of all time. Here is where he went wrong. Since Satan had dominion over man, he had the power of death over man. A slave owner can kill his slaves if he so desires. Therefore, Satan had the legal right to destroy sinful man under his dominion. But Jesus had never sinned. Jesus was not under his dominion. Therefore, Satan had no legal right over Jesus. So when Jesus allowed Satan to take his life, Satan became a murderer. So he killed an innocent man. In God's justice, the penalty for murder is death. Now when a person is waiting on death row to be executed, he has no dominion over anybody. And so in Hebrews 2.14, it says that Jesus through his death destroyed Satan, then that had the power of death. Dominion restored. So three days later, when some women went to where Jesus was buried, they were greeted by an angel who said, Do not be afraid, for I know what you seek. Jesus, who was crucified, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lays. Matthew 28, 5, and 6. Jesus had risen because he had never sinned. Therefore, death, death had no hold on him. After his resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven, where he represented his own blood as the legal evidence of Satan's guilt. Then Jesus sat down on the throne of the universe, showing that he has dominion over Satan, sin, and death. The Apostle Paul wrote the Ephesians that God, the Father, has given Jesus a position far above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is not is not is that is name. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He put all things under his feet. Ephesians 1, 21 and verse 22 through 22. He wrote the Philippian Christians, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, and those in heaven, and of those of earth, and of those under the earth, that every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of Father. Peter wrote of Jesus, who has given into who has got into heaven, and it is at the he's right at the right hand of God, under angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Through his resurrection, Jesus delivered the final blow to Satan's head, and the good news is that his victory is ours. Paul said it this way to the Colossians. And you being dead in your trespasses and under the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses, having wiped out the writing of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has it taken out of the way, had nailed it to the cross, having disarmed the principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, 13 and 15. So he explains that the handwriting of ordinances is the, the, the debt that we owe, which is the, our sin. We owe 
got our life because of our sins. But the Lord canceled that when we accept Him as our Savior. <clears throat> if you are a Christian, sin has no power over you. Satan has no authority over you. And death cannot hold you. Paul summarized this with one grand statement. Now thanks be to Jehovah who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2.14 Dear reader, you can join the parade of triumph by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can say to Satan, death and sin. I know you seek, whatever your name is, that old man is not here. He is risen as a new creation in Christ. In these next chapters, we're going to be learning how to walk in triumph. May Jehovah bless you as you continue in your